Cool. There you go. <laughs> That's better. Um, thanks for coming. Um, this talk's about optimistic UIs. Um, just to lay it out there, it's not an overly technical talk. It's kind of like a, a designer developer talk. Um, it's something that I want to talk about because since joining a product company and having more time to sort of focus on making the product better for the users, um, it's become quite an important uh, thing that I'm passionate about. So yeah, that's what I'm, we're talking about. Um, my name is Joe. I'm an Android engineer at a company called Buffer. Um, we're a remote company. If you want to know more about us, you can find us at buffer.com. And that's my Twitter handle down there. I've just tweeted out the slides, so if you want to follow along on your laptop or anything, then feel free to do so. They should be at the top of my feed. Um, so yeah, just to lay some foundations of what we are going to be looking at, because um, I know there are other talks on now, so I'd just like to, to um, let you guys know. We're going to begin by looking at what pessimistic and optimistic UIs are. Um, and, and how pessimism and optimism sort of applies to user interfaces in our applications. Then we're going to look at um, why people use pessimistic UIs um, and the disadvantages that this can bring to sort of the user experience that we're creating. Then we're going to be looking at an example or two, just some simple places of um, things in our applications where optimism um, can be applied to, to sort of um, increase the experience of our application. And then we're going to be looking at how we can handle errors in optimistic UIs um, gracefully so that our users are always aware what's happening in our app. And if we have time, we could be looking at the link between optimistic design and also offline support because the two kind of um, meet somewhere. So yeah, um, my English vocabulary is always really bad, so I just wanted to sort of clarify what optimism and pe pessimism are. Um, so optimism is like positive thinking. So you're sort of going to a situation with the attitude that you know, everything's going to be A-OK -okay and everything's going to go as planned. So like I could, before this talk, I'd be like, hey, yeah, I'm really pumped for this. I'm pretty sure this talk's going to go really well. I've been looking forward to it for ages. So yeah, I've got a positive outcome and a positive look on the situation. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have pessimism, which there you go, <laughs> which is the complete opposite, the other end of the spectrum of optimism. So going into a, a concept or a situation where you know, you're not quite sure if things are going to go as planned, um, it's kind of more of a, a negative outlook on things. Um, and because of this, we can often sort of have a more sort of a safer approach to things. So like trying to be a bit more cautious because we're not quite sure how things are going to go. And the way this, this relates to sort of our user interfaces is um, like this. So for example, um, we've been doing a lot of refactoring and sort of rebuilding parts of our app because we've uh, got a lot of legacy code to deal with. And in this process, some of the things we've been doing is trying to improve the experience. So this is what our composer used to behave like. So you'd go in, if you don't know Buffer, you compose updates like for Twitter and Facebook, and then those updates get put into your queue. So our composer, you used to open it up, enter some text, add some photos, and then you'd be showing this lovely progress dialog until that request had completed. Um, and obviously, if you're not on a fast network, um, this isn't a great experience because you could be waiting you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, or maybe even only like 5, 10 seconds. But if you all add that up over time of the usage of your app, that's quite, you know, it all adds up and it's not a great experience. This makes your app feel slow, um, luggish and it stops the user being able to multitask. Like, you know, you, you, fair enough, you could switch between apps, but then what happens if the system kills this process? So on the other hand, we have optimistic UIs. So this is where we, we completely remove that stage of waiting and that whole uncertainty of like, oh, I'm blocking you because I'm not quite sure if this thing is going to finish or complete, so we're going to stay on the safe side of things. But optimism, on the other hand, is, we well, you know, we've got a stable API, and the only thing that that could cause this to go wrong because we have a lot of client-side validation could be the network connection. So in this hand, what we've done is we shifted to the background task, we removed the progress dialogues, we removed the waiting, and that whole process is shifted out the way so the user can continue moving through our app and doing, you know, doing productive stuff and being able to move around freely and doing as they please. And you know, this isn't a common trend in apps. A lot of apps I use still have this whole thing of, you know, um, blocking, blocking UIs and things like that. So 
but why, why do we still have this in our applications? Um, and I think, you know, for me, for me anyway, it's, it's predictable, like, which is kind of bad. Like, when, a lot of apps I use, when I, when I hit save or when I hit edit or when I, when I perform actions, I almost expect there to be a progress dialog or something to be there that's in my way. Um, and it's because of that as well, like for developers as well, I think it's a, a default, like, oh, I'm gonna perform some sort of network request or some operation, so I should show a progress dialog. You know, it's a safe option, and it's something that we're used to doing, and I'm guilty of doing it quite often in time. It's error-proof, you know, it makes it easy for us to handle errors because the user's still within the context of where they've sort of carried out that task. Um, we, it's easy for us to handle errors. Like if you're, buff, if you're composing an update and it goes wrong, you're still within that screen and you can handle the error a lot easier than if the user's moved away from that. And finally, it's easier to implement. Like it makes our lives easier as developers, so why aren't we gonna do it? Like we haven't got to faff around with um, handling errors outside of the screen or the context where the user previously was. Um, yeah, so the issues with this, like the obvious one that we've already looked at is the user has to wait. Um, it removes the, the, the ability to multitask. Um, and it makes your app feel slow. Like, you can't, if, like I said, if you add up the amount of things that you could do, like I could compose an update, I can move around the app, I can reorder things and, and manage my social media schedule in the whole time that that progress dialogue is still there in the previous situation. And secondly, it, yeah, it makes your app feel like it's slow. And not only is that bad for your applica the application in hand, but if, I'm use if I use an app and the app's pretty like shoddy, I'm not gonna then recommend the other businesses' services to my friends. Like, you know, if, if your app's crappy, then what's to say your iOS app or your, or your web services are also in that nature as well. So it can have an effect as whole on your sort of the other business products that you have. And why does this happen? So why, why do we even have to think about these situations where you know, things might take time? Um, so I was trying to look up some interesting facts to do with this, and I can only find one, and I thought it was pretty interesting. But, um, so I found this white paper called The Response Time Between Man and Computer Interactions. So I had to look, because I couldn't remember the guy's name. But it was written by someone called Robert Miller. Um, and it was written over 50 years ago. And this, this white paper stated that the time between our finger sort of leaving, depressing from a button press, um, this was originally written for keyboards and typewriters, but the same rule applies, is 100 milliseconds. And that's not a lot of time at all. So by the time your finger leaves the screen or the key, we expect to see some form of visual feedback that that task has been carried out on the screen. Um, and the thing is with that, um, and what's even scarier is that you, know, you try and think, oh, what's 100 milliseconds? Like, you can't even count 100 milliseconds. And that's kind of equivalent to a human blink. Like, the average person blinks between 100 and 150 milliseconds. So you think of it, when you're using an app, when you're pressing buttons, um, you know, if you blink now, like, that's pretty quick. I'm expecting to see everyone blinking. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, that's pretty quick time. And, and fair enough, if you've got a good network connection, like a lot of us probably work in offices or from home, um, and we have, we're pretty privileged to have like, fast Wi-Fi, so we don't, and I don't often think about this kind of situations. Until you like, sometimes you walk around and I try to do this as best as I could, like, but it's not really that visible. But like we, like sometimes like I've got a European SIM card over here and the network connection is pretty crappy outside when I'm not on Wi-Fi. So I've been trying to like message my friends or upload you know, pictures to Twitter and stuff and it takes time. Um, because I'm used to, in my hometown, having a really fast mobile connection. So sometimes my mobile network isn't that great. And you know, so that's the only the odd occasion, but I'm used to having really quick Wi-Fi. But it's not just the odd occasion where this happens for some people. And some people who live in you know, developing countries or emerging markets um, experience these kind of connections all the time. So this is just a graph to demonstrate this. Um, so this blue one, these blue and purple are the ones that the ones to look at. So, the purple is HSPC, HSPA, which is like 3G connection. And then you have Edge, which is I think 2.5G it's called. But I haven't had one of these connections for ages in my hometown. But from what I remember, they're pretty slow. And the thing is, like, if you look at this, like, in this year, 
um, in these kind of countries like Middle East and Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America, like so many percentage of these connected devices have these kind of connections. And even in years to come, like still, like in the Middle East, like in 20, 2022, it's only predicted that between 60 and 70 percent of people will still be on these slow connections. And I know there's a lot of talk of offline app design and you know creating apps that work offline and. And I, I strongly believe in that. Um, but with at Buffer, we've been, because of like the legacy code and we have really small resource, and it's been hard for us to, to jump into that straight away. So we've been trying to work at ways to make our app quicker or appear quicker um, and creating a better experience until we reach that kind of, of stage. And the last point here is the failure to think. Um, so as I said before, um, we used to work for an agency, like we had like, Obviously, this isn't the same for all agencies, but we had deadlines, and, and whenever I was handed designs for an application, so I'm not slating anyone here because they're probably going to watch this, but um, I was never handed, <laughs> never handed designs for like loading screens or progress states. I was handed like these really like nice looking content lists and article screens, but never the never the steps between those. And I think this is often a stage which is sort of forgotten about between um, when you're designing apps. And obviously, as developers, we get handed designs and. We just build it, and then we don't think about that bit either, or at least I never did. And some people I've spoken about this to, like, isn't that just cheating, though? Aren't you just lying to your users? And no, because it's about how you convey it. Like, if something goes wrong, you let them know. And if you are carrying out a network request, then they need to know that something is happening. Like, you can't just shift it to the background and, you know, not them not be aware because they might switch on airplane mode or something without knowing it. So they need, the user needs to know that something is happening in your app to do with syncing or something. So yeah, so this is where I wanted to look at just one or two little examples of where we've been doing this. And these are just things, like, like I said, we've been doing to shift towards, like we're working towards offline design. And these are just a few ways that we're shifting towards that. And these aren't necessarily maybe might not be the best ways to do it or the, the ways that are the right ways to do it, but um, these are ways that we found have worked for us. So yeah, we saw this screen before. Um, I couldn't think of a more technical term for a situation where you open an activity and it closes when a network request is complete. So I called it finishing activities. Um, that's the best I could come up with. So yeah, we saw this screen before where we compose an update, we buffer it, and that screen is finished when the network request completes. So the flow kind of looks something like this. Um, something like that. <laughs> so we perform an action and we block the user with some, a progress dialog and then we wait for that to complete. And when that completes, um, we handle the response. And if that's successful, we close the activity, otherwise we handle the error. Um, pretty straightforward. And it's pretty obvious that the, these two things here are the bits that are the pessimistic approach to, to that flow. And what we essentially just need to do just is just remove those two and have something that's more like this. So we perform an action, we get rid of the activity. Um, if it's successful, um, you know, we can either refresh the updates or we can do cool stuff and add it at that point of time when the activity is closed. Or if it fails, we can let the user know that something's gone wrong. So the first point here was the progress dialogues. Um, those, those little things, um, and I'm sure everyone's seen a progress dialog. They're everywhere, they're really common, and they're blocking and incredibly annoying. But we have good news, if you didn't know already. As of Android O, they're deprecated. So, you know, um, the recommendation instead is to use things like inline progress bars. And um, that's what it says in the documentation. But I think, you know, that can be taken uh, in any other way, sort of like portraying that something is taking place um, by some form of icon or whatever. But um, yeah, so obviously deprecation isn't stopping you from using them, but it's not recommended to. And so yeah, they've been in there since API level one, and so now they're gone. And yeah, so if you do try to use them, you'll see this lovely strike through line through the progress dialog class. Um, and again, it's not stopping you, but I hope you remember me when you see that if you ever try to use them. <laughs> so there's no excuse. Um, yeah, so that's you know that's the removal of the pro progress dialog, and that's obviously that's just the case of deleting those lines from your code. So that's nothing complicated. So the main thing here is, is shifting that operation to some form of a background task so that we can, you know, we can close that activity and be gone with it. And the reason we have to do something like this is because we're losing, once that activity shut, that, that's it, the life cycle's gone. So we can't perform the operation inside that activity any longer. And this is why I wanted to use that as an example. God. 
Um, so yeah, what happens here is we buffer an update, and then we kick off a service. Um, so this is the flow we began with. Um, we start a service at the same time that we're finishing that activity. And then when that activity finishes, um, we, can, we can do stuff like we can refresh the updates or, or add that update that was created to our content list. And then when that service finishes, you know, we can handle the result. And if it fails, you know, we can show the user, um, but we look more at that later. So one of the easy things um, we can do is use a, a service. Um, so we can use the intent service class. Like if, you're, if you haven't used that before, you're not familiar with it. It's just uh, part of the Android framework that allows you to perform asynchronous work sort of off of the main thread. And we can pass it an intent. And that intent can contain some form of data that we want to carry out an operation from. So in our case, we, we have an update object. We pass that in within the intent, and then we do some work with it. So we make a network request, and this is happening in the background. And some cool things with the intent service is that we can use flags like this, like start, read, deliver intent. And this allows us to, so if the service is destroyed by the system, we can simply, the service will be restarted with the same intent that we created it with. Um, so there's some gotchas you have to be careful here. Like um, we had a weird edge case where the intent was re-delivered. Um, the, the, the request was successful, but before we had had a response back from the API, um, the system had killed the service. So we sort of fired it off again without knowing. So there's things like that to look out for. And there's also other, another thing to do with like power saving mode and, and sort of those mode and stuff. And background services don't operate too well with those kind of things. And that's another issue we came across. And for things like that, where you need more sort of conditional handling of background stuff, you can use classes like the job scheduler class. And a job scheduler class, um, so this actual specific class is only available from uh, Lollipop onwards, um, but there are solutions below that, but I um, don't have time to talk about all of them. <laughs> so, so yeah, the job scheduler class allows you to schedule different kinds of jobs against the Android framework. Um, so we can still use our same service class that we had before, but we can specify using uh, this job info builder class, we can specify sort of criteria to, to um, perform operations against, like specific timing or sort of network types that we require. So maybe you can be intelligent with this. Like, for example, like if someone buffers an update for two weeks time, like maybe we don't need to post it instantly to the API. Like maybe we can schedule it for, for when the user's connected to a Wi-Fi network or some form of better connection. And that's the cool thing about the job schedule is it allows us to be more, more intelligent with the, with the um, jobs that we're scheduling. So for example, we can batch jobs together. So if we're, say, if, say the user's performing, we're on a settings screen and, and you're performing loads of different changes to your settings, you can batch these jobs into, into um, batches of operations and the job scheduler can send them all out at the same time, which allows you to reduce power consumption in your apps. And like I said, a task may not need to go out straight away. Like you may not need to send some, buff, some post that's been buffered to the API straight away. So you can wait until the time is more appropriate. Yeah, and you can wait on specific conditions. And you can also repeat tasks if you need to. So if you have stuff like uh, syncing that needs to happen between sort of your database or, or API and other things, you can repeat those tasks as necessary. So the, the next point of this is, so we, we've scheduled our task, we've hit off a service, and this is happening in the background. So and the, the activity closes, and the user goes back to the screen. So this is the point where, hey, you could just um, wait till that's finished and refresh the updates. But then that feels a bit janky, because the user's sort of interrupted from their flow. And what you can do here is you can pass data back from your activities, or from within the service, you can update your database or adapter with the, the content that was created in that class. So here, um, what we started doing to, to, to have this done was when we buffered an update, we instantly updated the database that um, we, we had. So we never actually, in our app, we never actually had a database until this point of time, which made work incredibly hard. <laughs> but, um, so now we have a database. We can, when, 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 a, when an update's buffered, we can add it to our database um, at the point that we hit that request off. And the cool thing is that when we're doing, because we're doing it this at this point of time, when as soon as we hit buffer and before the update is completed, we can update our UI with that content. So we've added that content to our UI before that request has finished. Um, and that's being optimistic, because you know, we're pretty sure that this is going to be successful, and we've added this to our, um, our content queue. So if you're using things like RxJava, um, you, can, you, know, you, can, you can use like start with requests. So say, if, say when you hit off the service to, to, to create the update, 
you can, you can use the start with clause to say, hey, um, I'm going to insert this update into my database when this service kicks off. And then you can do intelligent stuff with the on error. Like you can handle that error case specifically. Um, you know, you, maybe you don't, you don't want to delete it from the database, but maybe you can, you can add a flag into that database to, to, to let the user know that that update has failed. And even better, if you're using things like uh, SQL, SQL Bright, um, you can observe changes to those updates from your presenter or your activity or, or wherever you're doing that. So this allows us to be really reactive um, with the things we're doing. So we don't even have to pass data back to our activities because we're doing all this stuff from our services and our presenters already listening for those changes to the database. And then we can use intelligent things like the recycle view swap method. So um, we could be more efficient. So if we're, if we're updating our database and we don't want to change the whole data that's there, we can just um, swap the classes out as need be. And in an ideal world, um, I'm not going to talk too much about this because I know there's been some talks on offline app design already, um, which are probably a lot better at explaining it than I could be. But um, we'd have, this is ex ex essentially what we're working towards is, is having this database that reflects our most up-to-date content in our application. And then we can use like sync adapters and stuff to sync this with our server. And, and this allows you to be a lot more flexible and a lot more optimistic in what you're doing. Um, but obviously, that's a lot more work. And, and the steps before this allow you to be, um, to be more optimistic in the actions that you're doing. And if you are doing things like this, then it's important to, ref like I said, reflect the state. The user needs to know what state the content is in. You, can't, you don't want to lie to the user. You don't want to sort of be too wishful thinking. And there's already great examples of apps that do this. Like, for example, um, Trello is a great one. If you, if you reorder cards and you're offline, you get a nice little, um, little sync a little sync icon there to let you know that that card you know, hasn't quite finished updating with the server yet. And, um, and here with Facebook and Instagram, like, this is like optimistic in action. Like if you hit like, if you hit heart, if you hit the, um, any of the like buttons, like I'm offline, but um, this has been recorded. And obviously, um, obviously that, that state is there and I can see that that's happened. So the user knows, like I'm not, I'm not blocking them. The user knows that that action has been taken place. So if you do encounter errors, like when, when, you're, when you are trying to be optimistic, like, like I said, the user needs to know that something has failed. So in the case of like simple things like content queues and stuff, um, we simply just show uh, a failed message on the card. Like if the, if the user tries to buffer an update and, and that service fails or something doesn't quite go as planned, um, one of the things we do is we make sure the card is marked as failed. Um, you can do things such as showing like error dialogues, but that kind of goes against <laughs> the whole point of this talk. So, um, so don't do that unless, you, unless it's an absolute last resort. Um, because again, you, you throw the user off and, and you take them away from, from what they're in the middle of doing. Instead, we can be more, more intelligent. Like, so we use um, snack bars a lot um, just because it allows us to, to show errors for any of this content throughout our app. So, so this is like our, our main content area, like our activity. And we have a lot of nested fragments within this. So like the queue, the reminders, and all of these bottom bar items all change fragments between our application. Because we can send like events to our main activity, um, we can have this snack bar can be shown throughout any of these. So if I, if I get an error in this content queue and I switch between any of these items, then I'll always see that snack bar for that error regardless of what screen I'm on. And the cool thing with the snack bar API is it allows us to have like, um, I haven't got a screenshot of this, but like actions. So you can have like a, a retry button or an undo button. So the user can retry that request from anywhere within this app without needing to sort of go back to where they originally were to begin with. So notifications are an obvious one. And I'm sure a lot of people here have, have probably used notifications. Um, they're a great way of sort of letting the user know. So maybe, maybe we show a Slack bar if they're within the app, but maybe, maybe if the app isn't in the foreground, we can, we can use a notification to let the user know what's going on. And in the case of buffering updates, we use heads up notifications. Because, because these updates are like time sensitive, like what if I buffer an update that needs to go out straight away? then heads up notifications allows us to sort of get the attention of the user that like, because it's time critical and they need to know that that update hasn't quite gone through. And um, obviously it is kind of distracting, um, but it doesn't stop the, the, they can still carry on using and just wait for it to disappear. And the final one is, 
notification badges. So that, again, this is only available as of Android O, and this is something I've been looking forward to. I really like these notification badges. But um, as of Android O, you have to group your notifications into what are called notification channels. Um, so maybe you have a channel for error messages. And if you utilize notification badges, they can be used to, to sort of let the user know that there has been an error that's taken place um, from outside of your app without needing to, to pester them with sort of popping up notifications and stuff. And the cool thing about these is like, my mum has an Android phone and she never clears her notification bar. Like, I, she'd be like, oh, my phone's broken. And I go to have a look and there's like streams of notifications. So like, she's someone who wouldn't see that. <laughs> she wouldn't see this notification at the top. So in her case, she'd see the notification badge and she'd know that the app has something that needs to be interacted with. So like I said, we'd, just for the last few parts, I just want to look at how optimistic and offline sort of do tie in together in terms of, in terms of design. Um, so, so we have this error state in our app, which is like really bad. And as much as I like the design, I really hate seeing that screen. Um, so if you open the app, you don't have a network connection, or you try and refresh content, then it will error because, like I said, we don't support offline yet. But like I said, if you have that database in place and you are caching your content, then there's no need for this. Um, there's no need for this error state because there's content already in your app that you can display to the user. And also, the same goes for progress bars, like loading state. Like this, this, lo these loading bars are a pessimistic design because you know we're not showing anything to the user, and we're kind of like, oh, obviously it's loading content, but we're kind of like it's us saying, hey, I'm not quite sure this content's going to come back. So here you go, here's this progress bar. But if we have content cached, we can be more optimistic. We can show them cached content, and then again use things like the cycle view swap method to update the content when stuff comes back. And again, if that fails, you need to let the user know. So yeah, to conclude, um, design for optimism. You know, you make use of what we have in the Android framework, like services and stuff, and and other things. Like I said, this is there's there's loads of places that you can apply this to, um, and this is only sort of one example. I just wanted to keep it simple, but um, you know, I hope for the best and and don't don't block the user in what they're doing. Um, so yeah, <laughs> don't use progress bars. Um, don't use blocking components and 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 take an approach that allows the user to move more freely around your app. And if you are syncing, if you are using like things like database and sync adapters, um, you know, you, you can make use of that. And, and if you're not syncing, then you, you do stuff intelligently with your cache or your database and, and your adapters. And so if you are performing op like actions on content, then make sure you reflect that in the UI um, instantly so the user can sort of see that change. And yeah, um, cache data where possible. Like, like I said, um, so I joined Buffer like a year ago, and we never had, we didn't, they didn't have a database, and we've only just recently added one. And I can't describe how much more we can do now we have that caching ability in place. Um, yeah. So thank you. Um, I know it's kind of short, but um, wasn't too much to talk about. Um, I hope you know, I planted some seeds or something to, to think about when you're sort of building and sort of looking at designing apps. Um, does anyone have any questions at all? Or not? Cool. Sounds good. Thank you. Mm -hmm.